podcast starts. Hello everyone and welcome back to Now The Podcast Starts, a show which talks about horror, cinema and anything related that takes the interest of my wonderful co-hosts or myself. I'm T.D. Velasquez, but as always you can call me Dan in Greater Manchester, and today I have the pleasure of being joined by... Kirsty Warrow in Shropshire. And also the inspiration for today's topic of discussion... Stella Gaynor in Manchester. Splendid, and we're going to be talking about horror remakes today... But first, have we got any exciting news from life or horror that we'd like to talk about? Well, I've, I've got two two bits. One from life, one from horror. So, um, if I kind of start with the li- life one. Sure. So, um, so listeners from last week might remember I talked about my husband shaving off his mahoosive beard for charity. <laughs> um, uh, and so that happened on, oh, excuse me, happened on Sunday. Um, and he's raised over £600. Um, so that's £200 per, at least per charity. Um, so that was going to be split between NHS Charities Together, um, Black Lives Matter UK and Stonewall. Um, and yes, and I can reveal that he does in fact have a chin. <laughs> and he is uh, um, really engaging with having a very cold face, um, but uh, you know, but it was not a horrific um, experience, I think, for for us. So that's good. He's still um, married. Yes, we are still married. <laughs> um, I still like his face very much, um, which is good. Um, so, so yeah. So just to check, Kirsty, you said <laughs> that it was not a horrific experience. So it was a horrific. Experience. No, it was not a horrific experience. Excellent. I'm very (laughs) glad to hear that. Um, and then on the horror news front, so uh, yesterday I came across um, an announcement um, from um, Blumhouse um, that they are have just announced a uh, an adaptation, another adaptation of Dracula, um, directed by um, Karen Kasama, who directed uh, Jennifer's Body and The Invitation. Um, so I think they, that's no, notable, not for obviously just our conversation today, but um, as a you know kind of female um yeah. uh, adaptation um and she seems to be placing quite a lot of emphasis on being doing a quite a faithful um adaptation of the novel yeah. particularly in terms of the kind of the changing of you know kind of perspectives in the novel yeah. this is what some herself says about her adaptation so she says i think something that gets overlooked in the adaptations of dracula in the past is the idea of multiple voices um in fact the book is filled with different points of view and the one point of view we don't get access to um, and all all most adaptations give access to is Dracula himself so I would just say in some respect this is going to be an adaptation called Dracula but perhaps it's perhaps not the same kind of romantic hero that we've seen in the past okay oh that's very oh, that's interesting. interesting yeah so if she's saying he's not going to be a romantic hero does that mean we're going to get a Dracula that's actually a monster because that, that sounds promising possibly yeah. Yeah, we I mean, shall see. Yeah. I'm attracted to that because my favourite bit of the book has always been uh, the bit on the Demeter. Yeah, oh, yeah. Just wiping out the crew, and yeah. um, and he he's there's obviously nothing remotely romantic or charming about him there. Um, and uh, yeah, I'd like to see if they can uh, extend that and keep that interesting for a whole movie. Um, again. Um, I don't. You haven't seen the the Stephen Moffat, Mark Gatiss one, no. have you, Kirsty? So I don't want to not, spoil not, it. Not yet. For, <laughs> for you. I've not seen it yet you, in the, Well, I'll just say they try to do something with that section of the book um, yeah. and extend it. Um, I'm not sure it's entirely successful, but we'll have that conversation another time. It is an interesting <laughs> take on it, though, and I, what I think it's safe to say is that. Um, probably that adaptation goes as far as you possibly can in terms of trying to give Dracula um, a character and a motivation and an insight into his uh, inner life. Um, And I think some of that worked really well, some of it less well. But it it kind of feels appropriate that we're going to have another adaptation which takes the exact opposite approach. Yeah, Um, yeah. um, Okay, that's that's really great news. Um, well done, Blumhouse. I, this sounds like maybe this will be, you know, one, the the 
one good film they make every 20 films. <laughs> um, they, they make 19 terrible horror movies to fund the one good film. <laughs> and, you know, I think that's a fair business model. So Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> oh, brilliant news. Um, well, yeah, that is an appropriate segue into our main topic this week, then, which is horror remakes. Um, now, Stella, I think you're a bit of an advocate yeah. of horror remakes. <laughs> I do. I love a remake. Um, I was trying to distill down as to like a quick soundbite as to why I enjoy a remake. And I think the quickest way to describe it is I like a remake because I'm intrinsically a very lazy person. Okay. So a remake means I don't necessarily have to pay that much attention to the story because I already know the story. <laughs> I can just sit down and enjoy it and, you know, I already know the basics. I already know the laws of whatever universe that we're in or what the monster can and can't do. So I think it speaks to my lazy soul, <laughs> a remake. But also, you know, if if a story is good, I think it's always worth telling again. So if we're thinking about, as we've just talked about Dracula, mm-hmm. gets adapted time and time and time again. Nobody complains about that. But horror remakes, they do get a bit of a bad press. I think it's worth sticking up for that kind of retelling of a story. Yes, I I think so. And actually, I don't (laughs) think that sounds too lazy. Um, It kind of reminds me of people who say they like music that has a tune. Um, (laughs) I always kind of think of like, well, a tune just basically means you probably know how the music's going to go before you've heard it. Um, Yeah. And... uh, and, uh, that's fine if if you don't want to kind of take that abstract journey with a piece of music that you don't know where it's going, then fair enough. That that's that's up to you. Um, and the, the same with remakes. I think. I mean, I have fairly mixed feelings about them. I suppose, Kirsty, how, how do you feel about remakes generally? Yeah, I again, it's it's sort of mixed feelings. Um, on the whole, I don't have any problem with the idea of remakes or reboots or whatever i don't um but i think that for me there are certain films which i hold quite dear Mm -hmm. um and i the idea of of certain remakes kind of troubles me just because i think there's i was thinking about this kind of obviously prepping for this and i'm aware that it's quite an emotional thing Mm. um where like a kind of I think particularly like being a kind of film teacher um I've been aware of having conversations which where well, I'm having a conversation about when referring one film to one film that's had a remake and I'm, I'm then aware that the student I'm talking to is not aware of the original film yeah <laughs> and yeah. yeah just has the experience of the remake um and so there's that kind of dilution or diffusion of the kind of cultural um kind of weight i suppose yeah um yeah. Mm-hmm. so i think you know sometimes my emotional reaction to to remakes is the idea that you know sometimes that might kind of it, it means that people have maybe not seen the original or less likely to see the original or um and that yeah and then we're thinking as well that it's not just the time thing but i always feel quite sad when you know um uh when a film that's not made in the english language is remade in America yeah. yeah when you know and often the the kind of the you know the American version is a sort of kind of pale much more kind of Americanized version and mm. and again I feel quite sad that people are not being you know they're not spending more you know distributors aren't picking up that film and spending more time and money encouraging uh, a English-speaking audience to see you know the original film rather than the remake but I'm aware that these are quite emotional responses I think to um to the idea of certain remakes but not all remakes yeah i mean i think i i feel the same way i think any sort of study that i've done or read about remakes comes from like an industrial perspective so why why does it happen in terms of a a business model you know what's what's the point and you know there's there are sort of answers and reasons for it and i think the the emotional response to remakes I do understand because there's, you know, films that we do hold films in our hearts sometimes. Um, and I think people are seen, you know, on, on various forums and chat rooms, you know, people seem to take it as a personal slight yes. that a film has been remade. And it's like, it's OK. Yeah. The original film still remains. The original film has not been harmed. 
and the remake is not intended to replace. Yeah. Um, because from from an industrial point of view, it's so. So here then, I think it's probably useful if I quote um, a friend of mine, Dr. Laura Mee at the University of Hertfordshire, and she wrote her PhD on horror remakes. And it was reading that that made me sort of kind of, I guess, change my mind about remakes and decide to accept them for what they are. But um, she said, um, in terms of the remake or the reboot, it does not harm the original. So she said, and I quote, the suggestion that a reboot replaces a version of itself within its franchised universe defies commercial logic. Causing viewers to forget earlier incarnations would challenge its own reason for being, end quote. So Laura's pointing out that these films, these remakes, reboots, sequels, prequels, whatever you want to call them, should be understood as existing alongside the others mm-hmm. and not instead of. And I thought that was a an incredibly insightful way of looking at it. And, it, and she talks about it in terms of seeing it as more of a story world universe rather than there's this film, and then we've remade it, so we forget about that old film. Yeah. It's not about this one. And I think the idea of the story world and the universe is particularly interesting and is very, very obvious if you... Um, well, Laura's uh, work, she looks at the story world of Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which I guess we can get to in a little bit, or yeah, I can rant about it now. It's up to you. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take things one step at a time. <laughs> I think, I think it's interesting, isn't it, the way the which that genre really kind of um, helps define how audiences are positioned to respond to those kind yeah. of remakes. So, you know, kind of in, you know, a comic book, you know, kind of sci-fi, you know, um, kind of fantasy genre, the, the idea of kind of multiverse and kind of different, you know, alternative universes is really, is commonplace. Mm-hmm. And so there's not a definitive version of any story or the way in which kind of, you know, and those things often happen or the those texts exist across you know kind of different media types yeah quite happily next to each other and they don't you know there's no kind of sense of of the audience um being positioned to sort of see you know kind of one as the definitive um yeah. version and yet you know for for whatever reason and it's not just horror though is it and then this i think any sort of you know kind of dramatic form that exists maybe more just in cinema that they seem to be more you know not I don't want to use the word definitive again, but at least sort of more kind of contained. Yeah. In a way that the audience might, you know, kind of be more likely to kind of get a little bit more precious about it. Yeah. I mean, you're right with, with science fiction and fantasies, definitely it thrives on that. So I don't really like talking about it because I'm not a fan, but Star Wars is the the best example of this kind of transmedia story world Mm. sort of exploitation I guess by well by Disney now yeah you've got your films and you've got your tv shows and you've got your novels and you've got your comics and you've got your merchandise and it it all tells one story and fans Mm. are quite happy to move between different platforms well there was there was the whole um thing wasn't there where where Disney essentially kind of de-canonized a load of the the kind of the I think the <laughs> novels. Yeah, because we don't own it. <laughs> yeah, which yeah, exactly, yeah. which made, again made some fans very unhappy. Yeah. Um, but with the kind of the extended universe stuff. So, um, that mm-hmm. whole kind of you know relationship between the you know kind of the the producers and their you know kind of legitimising of certain narratives, mm-hmm. and then the audience response is really fascinating, isn't it? Yeah. But yeah, that was just Disney being Disney. <laughs> <laughs> So I mean, amusing. I, I think, we, well, yes. Um, and, you know, soon they will own all of us. So <laughs> we better just get used yeah. to it. Um, Watch out, Netflix. They're coming for you. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, I think I'd just feed in that um, with the Star Wars example specifically, um, it's interesting that they haven't gone as far as remaking the original movie. But I do think that's probably <laughs> inevitable. Can you I just, imagine? <laughs> I, I, I think it's... Well, I mean, but, you know... Uh, they have remade it three or four times. They've just called it different things. Um, <laughs> uh, but I, I think that they're probably going to remake it at some point because the reason that this happens in comic books and uh, and things like that is just because I think it becomes impractical to keep the story going forward. Yeah. You, know, you, you might as well start it again. Comic books reboot quite regularly, don't mm. they? Um, and yeah. I thought that I've just had, while we're having this discussion, is that it's maybe a generational thing in that, um, you know, the movies that come out when you're a certain age seem to be the definitive version. I mean, Kirsty, yeah. you and I have talked yeah, about... Sure. We've talked about Bram Stoker's Dracula before. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And 
Um, you know, that, I think that's worth a, a whole other discussion as well. But yeah. yeah, certainly when we were when that came out to us, it probably felt like, well, why ever do another Dracula? Now it's done. <laughs> Um, yeah. and, and then obviously, um, you know, time just moves on and all the generations mm-hmm. come along and, and they uh, and they want and perhaps deserve the version of the story that speaks to the world that they're in. Yeah. Um, so that so therefore that kind of explains why people would have a very personal connection to certain texts at certain <laughs> times. And that, I think and there's... That, um, go on. Well, I was just going to say, and I certainly do as well. I, ha- I have my kind of holy grails i suppose yeah. um that i i feel differently about um w- w- you know which we may touch on but I, but i think that in general um yeah you just have to accept that that stories are told and retold and remakes happen yeah um what were you going to say star well i think there's it, it's probably not as clear cut as as i'm about to say it is <laughs> um but when so you're talking about, you know, you're, you're seeing Bram Stoker's Dracula, Bram Stoker's Dracula, um, and it gets retold, gets adapted again in various different formats, and that's okay. Um, when other adaptations of other pieces of classic literature get redone and retold mm-hmm. and remade, nobody seems to have a problem with that. You know, how many Frankensteins is there? Um, mm. Even the, the latest adaptation of Stephen King's It didn't get panned as much as somebody, you know, redoing say uh, Rob Zombie's Halloween so I wonder if there's a connection between when you're adapting adapting doing an adaptation of a piece of classic literature again that's fine but when you're retelling something that's just come from cinema and is already seen as a bit crass and a bit low like Rob Zombie's Halloween then people Mm. no one's got any time for it so I'm wondering if there's a cultural sort of legitimacy issue is issue the right word or just I think it's just you can see this pattern of there's another Dracula coming, fantastic, or they're remaking Texas Chainsaw Massacre again. Oh no! Yeah. So I just wonder where this difference is, where it lies. No, I, I totally, totally kind of see that as a point in that you know the the difference in you know mm. kind of high culture and low culture, and even yeah. even though a Stephen King novel you know might be regarded in terms of literature as not being particularly high, it still has more cultural value. Yeah, it's got more clout. Yeah, than you know a you know kind of low budget horror film. Um, yeah. And it, it's I think it's that that sense of you know kind of transmedia adaptation though, isn't it as well that yeah. because something exists in one form, you can kind of reinterpret it in different yeah. forms. Um, so television, film, you know whatever whatever mm. theater um and and that's okay um or well, that seems to be more acceptable than you know kind of just what you know some people would um including myself sometimes um somewhat unfairly sort of see as being kind of regurgitation within its kind of its yeah. own confines yeah well, i've seen it as particularly with horror that it just remaking horror films sort of signals not the death of the genre, but perhaps mm. the laziness of the genre. Yeah. It's just, in the first instance, it's very <clears throat> intertextual and self-referential anyway. Yeah. And then to continue to remake these stories and retell these stories can be seen as perhaps, yeah, the laziness inherent in the genre. I'm not yeah. saying the genre is lazy, but, you know, some people might say that. Yeah. But if you are going to think about it in terms of genre, then the remaking of a story is part of the fluidity and the evolution of genre anyway because the remake will always bring something else it will yeah. bring um something that's more culturally relevant you know like you said you know t- retelling dracula for 2020 as opposed to what year was bram stoker's dracula made 92 <laughs> yeah 92, 92 i know what yeah. <laughs> hell I know. Oh. But yeah, so that's however many years that is. I don't want to say no. how many years that is. Cry. Yeah. But it, it's adding in those cultural markers. Yeah. It can have technical developments as well, so it could possibly look a bit better. Mm. So you know, it's it's it it does contribute to the fluidity and evolution of genre. I think, even though you are still telling the same ish story. Yeah. And there is a fun to that, though, isn't there? There's a kind of enjoyment of, you know, yeah. as a viewer, what what are they keeping? What are they changing? Yeah. Um, and to what extent are, you know, kind of uh, viewers increasingly um, sort of on board with a kind of metatextual kind of discourse yeah. around, um, you know, the kind of knowing 
way in which a f- you know film references its predecessors. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Did um was it the opening sequence of the latest version of it with Georgie and the boat and the grid and you know the clown in the in the grid drain shudder um (laughs) god wake up stella Um, (laughs) anyway so at the start of the new it um that was identical wasn't it shot for shot i'm sure it was and i was like oh that's really lovely and i can't wait to see that on a big screen because i only ever saw the older tv version on 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 vhs and i thought that doing the exact shot for shot at the start i thought that was a really nice friendly thing to do whereas other people had a bit of a whinge about it. You're going to remake it. At least do it differently. <laughs> uh, but yeah, but, oh, but it looks nice. Come on. Yeah, and again, <laughs> there are certain things that you just you don't change, and certain yeah. things that you do. Um, in an industrial context, I think it's worth pointing out that you know there've, there've been remakes in every genre, True. Um, as long as cinema, and some classic movies that we don't think of remakes. Uh, we don't think of as remakes were remakes mm. like the Maltese Falcon. Mm. Um, yeah. yeah, you know, who's seen the original Maltese Falcon? Um, uh, not me. And, <laughs> and, you know, Hands up, most of in film studies who's not seen the original. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think anybody has. I think you're all right, Stella. Um, uh, you know, uh, I think that because audiences have beco- become more and more kind of media savvy over yeah. the generations then um, people are more aware now of when things are remakes. And, um, you know, especially now, uh, everything is kind of supported by the internet um, and the ease of available Mm -hmm. information, which is why you get remakes that just have the same title or even sequels that have the same title as the film that they're sequelizing. Because somebody can just type it into IMDb and it says, brackets 2020 next door so you know which version you're looking at um whereas previously that 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 wasn't the case and a a film could more easily get away with not being seen as a remake um Mm. and also we still have stealth remakes um you know um (laughs) like you know mrs brown's boys the movie is technically a remake (laughs) Dan, you said it. Ugh. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> you have to take in the conversation, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just, I just find it fascinating um, that you know, you, because of transmedia adaptations like you were talking yeah. about, Kirsty, you can get multiple versions yeah. of. So that character has been played by um, uh, Angelica Houston in a previous movie. Um, that just kind of melts my brain when I yeah. occasionally... It's too early for that sort of mental gymnastics. Yeah, uh, yeah so, um, so you know. Um, I do think it's interesting, Stella, particularly the point you made about the fact that horror is kind of already seen as a low genre mm. um, and then kind of by remaking it, um, you, you are debasing it even further because... Yeah. Um, and, and developing uh, Kirsty's point about the transmedia thing, you you kind of separate. You, the, there is no longer the shield of oh, this is based on a respected book or a respected thing from yeah. some other medium. Um, it's just like uh, it's almost as if remaking a movie is a copy and paste job. Mm. Um, possibly, um, I, I think that this betrays a certain lack of awareness of how difficult it is to make a movie. Um, yeah. Uh, whether whether or not... If you did set out to make a movie that was literally a copy and paste, of uh, it was a direct imitation in every possible way of another movie, that's really difficult for a start. Um, you know, Gus Van Sant's Psycho. Um, say yes, what, <laughs> I was uh, just yeah. thinking about that. Whether it's enjoyable <laughs> or not, it's fascinating as a piece yes. of art because... yeah. What the hell were they doing in a way? <laughs> um, uh, and and th- and then on the other hand, trying to do a remake but deliberately make it different throws up its own massive complications, and there are so many. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, I mean, you're just going to annoy the, somebody else if you do it that way. So I think there are yeah, two two win. things that I'd, I'd like to kind of draw out at this point. One is is they that the but the kind of horror fans. You know, the kind of proper genre enthusiasts. Mm. They don't care about any of that stuff anyway, do they? As in, it's, you know, there's a kind of um, almost a sort of 
I don't know how to, to, to phrase this kindly and I'm not and I don't mean to be disparaging, but there's a sort of kind of reveling in the kind of trashiness or the perception of trashiness yes. of the genre. Um, sure. So, you know, the kind of people who, who, you know, this is really for don't care about that kind of level of low genre or, you know, whatever. And That's then the, it's, the other it's the punky aesthetic, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And um, that's your inbuilt audience yeah. for the makers of these films. yeah. And- and then the other thing as well, I'm just going to go back to what um, you were saying before, Stella, about the kind of updating it, um, is that there's something inherent, isn't there, about the way in which um, kind of horror moves on in terms of pushing the boundaries about what is socially mm. acceptable, which inevitably means that what your parents found horrific at the cinema yeah. is you are going to find lame as a young viewer um, <laughs> and you're going to want to a, a, a film that is more kind of grotesque, more, you know, kind of has more abjection, has yeah. more horror, you know, as in, you know, kind of horrific, gory, you know, uh, unnerving elements, um, yeah. which, you know, kind of from a... Yeah, you know, in terms of you said talking about kind of renewing the genre is that's yeah. something that kind of is inevitably going to happen. I think that there are lots of voices in horror that do that, but with kind of, you know, original pieces like Ari Aster, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, the kind of cultural cult property of the kind of big horror franchises like Texas Chainsaw for example, it mean that, you know, it's kind of, it's an obvious thing, isn't it, for, for filmmakers to do to kind of update them, but make them kind of scary mm. to a contemporary audience. Yeah. And you can, you can get rid of, say get rid of, um, cause we're not replacing the original films, are we? Remember what you said 10 minutes yeah. ago? Yeah. Um, <laughs> you're dealing with or omitting perhaps elements from films that might have been problematic. Yeah. So, um, you know, lots of the gender politics for example in i spit on your grave which i won't get into because it is quite grim in the remade version that's kind of dealt with in in a more appropriate fashion Mm -hmm. um so the stories that's worth telling updating it for the modern audience as you say with more gore perhaps with more violence it's keeping a story alive i guess is alive the right word for a horror film but (laughs) you know it's keeping it relevant to you know say younger horror fans now hopefully if that maybe if they see a remake they might go back and watch the original yeah hopefully that's always you know nice and i think another thing i guess to add in here is that remakes they have the detail and the backstory that horror fans talk about themselves anyway Mm. so horror fans will speculate on why a monster is the way that he or she is what what happened afterwards you know when the police gone you know people fans we talk about this stuff we like the story extension and the remake can sometimes just give you that so if you look at um well should should we talk about one of our films that we've watched if we look at carrie because that adds in the extra information that i think is really really interesting uh, Editor Real Dan here, sorry to interrupt the flow. Just thought I'd give you some contextual information about each remake we discussed, because we didn't always make that clear in the discussion. So if you don't know, Carrie, directed by Kimberly Pierce in 2013, is a re-adaptation of Stephen King's 1974 novel of the same name, which had previously been adapted for the cinema by director Brian De Palma in 1976. These all tell the story of Carrie White, an American high school girl who is beset by multiple torments at the hands of school bullies and her own religiously zealous mother, torments which spur Carrie's own latent telekinetic powers. In the original film, Carrie and her mother were played by Sissy Spacek and Piper Laurie, whereas in the 2013 film those roles were taken by Chloe Grace Moretz and Julianne Moore. The book was also readapted as a movie for TV in 2002, directed by David Carson, and there was also a belated sequel to the 1976 film, titled The Rage Carry 2, and directed by Kat Shea in 1999. Both the 1976 and 2013 films are currently available to view on the MGM Classics streaming service. I've watched the remake, I've seen the original as well, but not for a long time. And, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, so I'm not sure. In fact, after I watched the remake, the few bits that struck me as different, I went and rewatched those bits of the original to check right. what they were, they were like, and they were actually the same. So I right. didn't notice that much that was different. Um, so I'd be interested. I'd be interested in your examples there. 
Um, so for me, I felt that um, showing us Carrie being born, I felt that that gave us a bit more insight into her mother, yeah. played by Julianne Moore. And I must say, I love Julianne Moore always and all the time and everything that she's in. Um, so we're seeing a bit more of the mother and mm. her, her self-harming um, and the way that the mother just feels the awful, awful, I don't know, guilt for being a mother um yeah, yeah guilt for having had sex at once and liking it um i, f- I thought mm. that was really really good and mm. the the further expansion of of the bullies stories so just how awful they were um and the remorse that sue it's called susan isn't it the remorse that sue feels where she wants to sort of help carry out and get what's he called tommy to take her to the prom i felt that the backstory of those people in the newer version of Carrie it was really helpful. Um, I, that's something well, I did spot, actually, but I didn't go back and check. I think I, it seemed new to me that in the remake, um, Sue and Tommy um, both agree to Tommy going to the prom with Carrie yeah. just to make her feel better. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is that in the original at all? Um, does he have a, a different motivation for going to the prom with her in the original? The motivation is the same, isn't it? But I think it's not as well, or it's not as explored in as much detail. No, right. he's not as yeah. likable, is he? I don't think in the in, in the, the original. original. Yeah. No, I don't think so. Okay. Yeah. Might have just been his dodgy hair, though. <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> um, um, I thought he was likable in both versions, actually, as I remember. Um, but it's been a long time. Uh, it's Ansel Elgort in the remake, and it was great to see him. <laughs> before Baby Driver. Yeah. Um, he's yes. got a ton of charisma. Um, yeah. So I, I thought he worked really well. I enjoyed the film, I have to say, overall. And, yeah, I'm being thick. I did obviously notice that the whole um, opening of the film and lots of the stuff about Carrie's mum was different. That was mm-hmm. fairly straightforward. Um, it was a few of, of the later moments that, uh, that I went back and checked and was surprised that yeah. they were the same. Um, what else were you going to say, Stella? In the newer one, Carrie realises her power a lot earlier, doesn't she? So she starts sort of experimenting with it. Yeah. Um, in the scene in the bedroom where she's moving the books around, I felt that was a bit Matilda. I wasn't quite into that scene. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I agree there. Uh, yeah. So I was just like, uh, no. All the stuff about Carrie researching her own powers, that's not in the original, is it? No, no I don't no. think she realises it, does she, in the original? Yeah. Okay. She's, she knocks a kid off her bike at the start, doesn't really know what she's done. Then hmm. I don't think she realises it until the the final showdown, and even then I don't think she quite knows what's going on. The poor girl. Um, but in the in the remake, she's sort of testing her powers, testing them out, and there's more instances of her using her powers, which I think's good, and I've really enjoyed that part of the movie. Um, I mean, I don't want to spoil it. Yeah, is that even a a thing when we're talking about remakes but the uh, the final sequence yeah is yeah, yeah. a lot more uh special effectsy but well, i don't think it's as frightening do you mean no the, i would uh, agree when, when you say the final sequence it's not like the, do you, do you mean the bit in the prom or the bit with carrie the prom mom? Uh, yeah the prom. yeah um, i think it's okay to talk about that because that sequence is so famous from the original film Mm. And it's basically the same in the remake, except stylistically. I think the remake made me think, uh, or made me think back to when I watched the original and, you know, the striking use of split screen that they make use of in that movie. And I actually thought at the time, "Uh, this is interesting, but I'm not sure the split screen is really necessary. Uh, I think it would have worked fine if it was just left with conventional um, filmmaking techniques but then I th- I did think that the remake was much less powerful as a result yeah. of being more conventional in that yeah. sequence yeah I, I have to say I've kind of found it a little bit I'm not sure if this is the right term sort of anachronistic a little bit in that it's clearly a contemporary film and I thought the the use of or the inclusion of kind of social media elements Mm -hmm. obviously makes it kind of really contemporary and heightens that sense of kind of Carrie's 
um, you know, kind of bullying um, and, you know, kind of her exclusion from the kind of social group. Um, but, you know, unlike, you know, kind of other remakes, the kind of use of the, the kind of keeping of the names of the key characters. So it's like Sue and Chris for, you know, kind of contemporary uh, American teenagers sort of felt a little bit like, oh, OK, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it's like what teenage girls now are called Sue and Chris. Called Sue. <laughs> yeah. yeah and um, I- I felt that a few of the modern elements did seem kind of tacked on as well. Yeah, um, yeah. And I think, I, I don't know exactly, but, you know, this movie went through a number of rewrites and reshoots, and mm. one of the writers involved was Lawrence D. Cohen, who wrote the original movie. Right. And and there is a certain sense of, this is like an old guy's take on what the kids get up to, <laughs> you know, the, the way that um, yeah. they, they so... suddenly project the video image... Um, in the prom scene and things like that. Yeah. yeah. It's like you could have just inserted that page into the script of the original movie and they yeah. do, they, they, they activate the video projector um, and things <laughs> like that. Yeah. I mean, I, I think the other thing that kind of, like, I, I enjoyed the remake, but I, the the original, um, as we kind of alluded to, I think in, in the previous episode, for me has this really, you know, kind of important place in my development as a horror fan yes um and is one of the first horror films that i remember sort of seeing and kind of relating to as a female viewer um Mm -hmm. with the kind of depiction of uh you know kind of a teenage girl you know experiencing um you know kind of coming of age and you know important kind of rites of passage yeah and um and yeah, and just and being genuinely frightening, the kind of you know the kind of bits in the original film where she's sort of in the closet with the you know kind of glowing eyes of the um, the the um, Virgin Mary, mm. very you know kind of impactful, I think. Um, and then just thinking about the way that um, Sissy Spacek in that film is just, it, I you know kind of remember being really kind of bowled over by how ethereal she is on mm. screen um how sort of unknowable and meek and so that that in the kind of you know in the iconic kind of promising when this sort of power rips out of her it seems you know all the more shocking i think because yeah. of that and so i also i appreciate the point about the kind of seeing her develop the power in the in the remake um i'm not sure that works for me in terms of the you know the kind of the shockingness of it in the way right. which does it in the, in the original and then that kind of got me thinking a little bit about casting and about the way in which our kind of knowledge of those actors so you know as a young teenage girl watching carrie i wasn't really familiar with sissy spacek because of that dislocation of space between me as a viewer in the 90s and the film being made in the um in the 70s um and me as you know a kind of media literate culturally literate adult viewer watching carrie um with um chloe uh moretz gray or grace moretz sorry um Mm. and how i'm aware of her from you know things like um uh, oh gosh, what well, I've forgotten it now. Where she plays She's hit, in Kick-Ass, yeah, in Kick Ass, where she plays yeah. Hit Girl, and is the, you know this little kind of you know um, you know kind of powerful um, and quite charismatic you know kind of um, film performer. Um, so I just I found that I didn't buy the idea that she was <laughs> you know kind of the obvious you know kind of subject of bullying mm-hmm. um, in the same way that I bought Sissy Spacek, but yeah. Yeah, I think, again, it speaks to a, the kind of generational gap. The casting, yeah. for me... <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Uh, ...works. Uh, well, no... Uh, <laughs> sorry, Kirsty. I just mean... Bet- I mean, between the, the remake and the original, really. Yeah. Um, you know, for me, um, I, I was probably around the same age as you when I saw Carrie, the original, and didn't really know who Sissy Spacek or Piper Laurie were. So yeah, they were those characters. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I remember before I even saw the film, I saw that that image, the famous image of Sissy Spacek draped in the pig's blood. Yeah. yeah. Uh, with that look of fury on her face. And I just found it terrifying, just yeah. visually. Um, whereas on watching the remake... Um, Oh, sorry, and and an interesting point about the original was that the supporting actors were more famous than the the main actors. So I knew, obviously, John Travolta and um, Nancy Allen were playing the bullies and PJ Souls. 
yeah. which I, which was fine because I think it helped make those minor characters have more of an impact. Whereas in yeah. the remake, the, the two actors I'm most aware of are obviously um, Chloe Moretz and Julianne Moore, yeah. who I've seen in many, many other films. So yeah. it was an additional leap. And on the other hand, the, the bullies were not played by actors that I knew. Having said all that, you know, <laughs> it, it's inevitable that those kind of shifts are going to happen mm-hmm. um, as as we grow older and we become more cine literate and not, and obviously the industry does depend on bankable names being the leads yeah. in movies yeah. and I, and I, and I think City SpaceX was a name even in 1976 oh, yeah. I think yeah. she'd been in Nashville hadn't she you know so in a way that's just my perspective that I hadn't seen any other films with her or with Piper Laurie before I saw Carrie yeah, um, but they're so powerful in those roles that it's hard to expunge the image of those characters, even when I, I now do see those actors in other movies. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's a kind of you know overlay process, isn't there, as a spe- spectator when you've seen both of that, just sort of sense of you know as you're wa- it's almost like you're watching two films at the same time. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. The other one's yeah. running in your head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. And I think you you can't help but make a comparison because you just just what brains do and yeah. that's that's okay to 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 be doing the comparison like you said dan to go back and look, look at those sequences again and see well what's different and what's what's changed when we talked about before about the emotional link that we have with films i saw the original carrie and i was far too young to be watching it i think i was nine or ten wow um and the whole film frightened me but the the prom scene sequence really really frightened me and it definitely bothered with my sleep for a long time so I didn't re-watch the original Carrie for ages because I was I've you know nope not watching that talking back to our films that scared us last week mm-hmm. um so in watching the remake I guess because it's not as scary a film as the original one I don't think I no. think it's an all right film but I don't think it's as frightening so maybe watching the newer version the remade version is uh, slightly safer for me to watch because I'm not going to go, oh no, at the end when it's the, you know, when it's the bits that scared me when I was a child. Yeah. So perhaps there's a safety contained within it. But, you know, when Chris and Billy, their death sequence, I think is bloody brilliant. Yeah. That's <laughs> really, was, really well done. Yeah. That, that in was the remake. The one, but yeah. In the remake, yeah. 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 yeah I yeah. that was great. That was definitely worth a, a pause and a slowdown. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Um, yeah, I enjoyed that too. I, I I enjoyed the whole movie, and I think that the point you make there is another kind of defense of the status of remakes, because whether you particularly loved or were traumatized by the original or mm-hmm. just really enjoyed it, the, the remake gives you an opportunity to re-experience it not directly, so it bypasses the law of diminishing returns in a way. Um, if... if the remake is not so great, then you still have the original to go back to. But if it's fine, then um, then you'll have another good experience to add to the original. And I think it's the same reason why people see movies of their favourite books and then inevitably yeah. come home with the comment, well, it's not as good as the book was. Yeah. Um, <laughs> which, of course, it isn't, because it's not a book. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's, that's what drives me crazy. <laughs> yeah. It's but, dead different. <laughs> yeah, you're never going to have the same experience that you did reading yeah. the book. But on the other hand, I, I always like to see movies based on books that I like because of being able to re-experience the story, but also um, kind of be intrigued by the changes and be surprised a little bit. Mm. I mean, there's a trope that I think that um, happens in a few remakes, which is that they have either a different ending or another ending on top of the existing ending. Which yeah. is which I feel is almost like an acknowledgement of, to the audience of you guys know this story, so we're going to give you a bit more at the end. So uh, the remake of well, uh, Red Dragon, which is a remake of Manhunter, does that. Right. And several of the versions of the Hand of the Baskervilles have a different ending tacked on. Um, every single different version of the Woman in Black has a different ending. In, in whatever medium you look at. Mm. Um, mm. And I, I, ju- I think that's something that's often done. And kind of an, an acknowledgement that the original exists and you can always yeah. go back to that. Um, 
but let's have as much fun as we can with with telling the story again in a slightly different light. Yeah. Um, something that you talked about, Stella, which um, I think is useful to mention now because we've been talking about the Carrie remake, is the idea of horror remakes melding with the idea of a franchise. So, um, yeah, as in... Um, you know, remakes kind of being an alternative to sequels or a member of the procession of of sequels that come from an original movie. So, I mean, Carrie, again, I think the remake, the 2013 Chloe Grace Moretz version, is kind of separated from direct comparison with the original because of the fact that Carrie had already been remade as a TV movie. And yeah. there was... Um, a sequel as well to the original movie, which was called The Rage Carry oh, the 2, Rage. <laughs> which came yeah. out in 99. Um, and therefore, I, I think it, you know, uh, to use a, a modern piece of parlance, your mileage may vary. There are some movies <laughs> that can do 10 <laughs> interesting sequels and some movies which might do one or two, but they mm. quite often come to the point where it's like, we don't know where else to go with this, let's go back and tell the original story again. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that's kind of reasonable. Um, sometimes I, I do find it a little bit dispiriting if I think, no, there's loads of potential in this series for new stories. Why are you going back so early and, and retelling the original story, which um, is w was kind of my main beef with the Ghostbusters 2016 film if we ever are going to touch on that um, but I do think that essentially a sequel is a retelling of the original story anyway so um, a lot of the time, not always um, so packaging it as, as a remake but the next chapter in the franchise isn't totally unreasonable I think uh, mm. what more would you like to say about that Stella? I think sort of coding the the remake in similar to a front the method of franchise also sits inside one of the major um criticisms I guess of horror and particularly you know the slasher sequel how many Friday the 13th is there how many mm. halloweens is there how many saw movies is there and for people outside of horror and so for critics outside of horror that's a very very easy thing for them to latch onto and say look this is why horror is no good because it just tells the same story it's just got the same monster over and over again sure but it's i don't know i think it's i think it's more nuanced than that there's there's even if so let's say um the nightmare on elm street sequels on and on they go for however many there is. I don't even know. I should have checked that. But you've got Freddy Krueger and you he changes as a monster. He stops being a force of, well, he's, he's still pretty evil, but he stops being scary. He stops being nasty and he becomes a figure of fun. So even inside that small sequelized universe, there's been a change. There's been a development. There's been a shift in its own genre. It moves into comedy more than horror. So I think rather than just it being pounced upon us, oh, that's just, you know, horror retelling remaking not making any effort to be in any way um new i think is is a little unfair um as well it can get it is more complicated than it's just being you're just retelling the story and retelling the story again i think it's worth thinking about in terms of the idea of simulation and copies the texas chainsaw massacre i'm going to talk use that as an example is based loosely on the character of the person of Ed Gein, killed some people, dug some people up, made furniture out of them. We all know about that. Yeah. <laughs> then the text was, we don't need to go into that because it's the morning for us still. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, belts made of nipples? No. no. Right. Then the Texas Chainsaw Massacre gets made. And the Texas Chainsaw Massacre was um, claimed, you know, based on a true story, had that whole thing when it came out. It was marketed as a true story. It turned about to, out to be fictitious, obviously. Mm. But it was loosely based on Ed Gein. And then you've got the Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 in 1986. And then the Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3, Leatherface, in 1990, which is a sequel. Then you've got mm. Texas Chainsaw Massacre Next Generation 1994, which is a loose remake of the 1974 film. That's the one where... With uh, Matthew McConaughey and... That's um, the one. Uh, the, uh, Renee Zellweger. 
Yeah. Yeah. So that's 1994. Supposed to be a loose remake of the 1974 original. Okay. Then we skip to 2003, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which is a remake slash reboot. Nobody even knows what that is. And you got Texas Chainsaw Massacre at the beginning in 2006, which is a prequel to the 2003 remake. Are you with me? <laughs> and then Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3D in 2013, which is a sequel to the original three movies in the series. And then there's also comics and video games. So right. you've got this whole story world of Texas Chainsaw Massacre going on, all supposed to be based on Ed Gein. So what you've got is all these stories moving further and further and further away from the truth, which is what Ed Gein was up to in his house, which was a load of wrong stuff. Mm. And it means that Texas Chainsaw Massacre then is just sort of existing as as a simulation all the time. And it's just moving us away from the original story. And the most interesting point about it is these copies this idea of this monster leatherface it then moves on to another platform so he, he appears in um american horror story 2 in asylum as bloody face so again you've got a copy of the same monster it's been developed but on a different medium on a different platform okay so these copies they're each creating their own reality i guess with this monster inside it and each one absorbs the last one and takes on the last one's rules or events or addictions that might have happened in the first one or the original one or the one before it. And it just expands and it expands and it becomes almost canonised, I think. So their sequels and their franchises and their reboots, and it's just, it's a really interesting and exciting and worthwhile place to have these monsters developed, to have these films being made, and to not just think of it as, oh, it's another one. <laughs> Actually, it's an expansion of the original. It's an expansion of this truth, this copy that started with, with Mr. Gein. Mm. Stella, can I, can I ask about how you kind of think about, well, sorry, I need to formulate my thoughts a bit, um, <laughs> that, that kind of sense of how important it is to locate, or for the viewer to be kind of adequately located within that space? As in, you know, do you think that like a, a person, a, a, a genre franchise Leatherface fan who has seen yeah. all of that and knows all of that is best <laughs> place to cash out all of that kind of meaning um, yeah. and to fully, you know, but then a kind of a, a regular viewer who perhaps has very little kind of sense of where these things come from. Do you, you know, do you think that there's, that it's up to the kind of producers to locate the viewer? in those spaces or is it irrelevant do you think each film you know could just be taken on its own merits oh so do you mean like is it worth is it more satisfying to see it all and to understand it all or to just jump in and out and see little bits um and should the, yeah should the makers of the film should the makers of the films be aware that not everybody will see and know all of that yeah i suppose so um i suppose it the answer is there an answer it depends how die hard the horror fan is i suppose or the person watching the film so with all those texas chainsaw reboots and prequels and recalls of whatever they all there are i wonder if anybody's really going to be bothered to watch texas chainsaw massacre in 3d in 2013 if they weren't aware of all the other ones yeah so i wonder if because like you said before, when fans are expecting and they're reveling in this repetition that we get in horror, I wonder how much, how many of these texts get seen by people who ultimately don't care yeah. <laughs> or who are not that, who are not involved. So when I've done lessons on this and I've asked the class how many people have seen Texas Chainsaw Massacre quite a few of them will put their hands up and then I ask well how many have you seen this one that one and the other one and this one and the hands get you know the numbers of yeah. hands get lower and lower and lower and I think people are either in it for the long haul or not and I think those that are not just don't care yeah and the people that are in it for the long haul or are more prepared to maybe dig a little deeper and see what the story is based on I think that the fact that it repeats all the time is exactly what you said before that's okay horror fans quite enjoy that and it is coded and it is built inside this industrial incentive of having an inbuilt audience yeah but also because horror is <clears throat> in some respects built on the idea of the franchise built on the idea of the story world then it it just works and the remakes are, are caught inside that and to pull the remake out and say, oh, we shouldn't be remaking that story. 
and think, well, you know, horror just does that, and that's okay. Make more. <laughs> I haven't made a film. You have, so go for it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's interesting. I mean, I think my immediate answer to that would be that I, I just feel like all films have a responsibility to stand on their own, regardless right. of whether they're a sequel or whatever. But that does come from an age that we're probably moving out of, which is basically, you know, cinema exhibition being based on what's on your local cinema at night uh, this week and you go and watch a film not necessarily knowing what it was and the producers of the movie are just wanting to grab you um, mm. and they want your ticket money so therefore they, they have to give you something that you're in the mood for. But it might be a sequel to something else or a remake but it doesn't matter. The point is that the, the audience has to be kept happy there. Whereas yeah. these, these days I think we're probably getting to a point where if a movie does... Um, enter your awareness that looks kind of interesting to you but you're aware that it's a sequel or a remake you might think well I'd rather watch the original because of streaming services and things like that it's more accessible you can mm. probably find the original somewhere so mm. therefore it's maybe less important I mean um, some people um, who are not hugely fans find some of the Marvel Cinematic Universe movies kind of a bit alienating as they grow into being a larger yeah. interconnected yeah. narrative. Um, yeah, I was going to just going to suggest that yeah that you know Marvel are building on this same thing. It's the big one big universe. Come and come and enjoy it all. But yeah, some of the films do they stand up on their own? I think they all try to, but mm. it's difficult, yeah. isn't it? Because some of them fall into there are too many characters, there are too many in jokes. I was just going to just kind of not ask a question, or just it's a rhetorical question. I think was the thing is about the way in which the um, kind of those cinematic universes um, are conditioning, you know, conditioning us as audiences to expect that from yeah. franchise mm -hmm. um, and the you know, and it's not just cinema, is it? It's also kind of HBO and kind of you know, long form television drama mm. with which has increasingly more cinematic kind of appeal that we kind of expect a kind of com a more episodic experience from our cinema. And I, you yeah. know, I was kind of thinking about the the, and again, I know it's an emotional thing, it's a preference thing, but I, you know, I kind of I don't have a problem with franchises in in horror and in, in any fran you know kind of all reboots. Just kind of what I appreciate is. Uh, a kind of sense of, of a spe as a spectator that you know any remake or reboot is aware of itself in terms of yeah. its you know sequence um uh, so you know kind of that self self referential stuff um or if it you know entirely dislocates itself from it the kind of previous stuff um in and and sort of sets out its you know kind of it's still in a very very different way like and again not for not horror but like casino royale did um, mm. to sort of, you know, sort of say, okay, here we're scrubbing everything, start it again. Um, yeah, so I think it, for me, it's often is just having a, a, a like, I'm, I like the kind of consistency of a whole or knowing, you know, kind of where a particular text fits in relation to its, its, its kind of predecessors and with, you know, kind of remakes where there isn't necessarily a sense of that being true. Um, although I can't think of a specific example. I've often found myself irritated by, you know, uh, what I felt has sometimes been a l lack of respect <laughs> for its heritage, <laughs> you know. Did you think think that about any of the films that we watched this week? Well, I, I mean, this is what I think maybe, not entirely, but a little bit with um, Let Me In. Editorial down here again, just to fill in some of the background to Let Me In. This American-British co-production, released in 2010, was written and directed by Matt Reeves, who had previously made 2008's Cloverfield and is currently directing 2021's upcoming The Batman. It's a remake of the 2009 Swedish film Let the Right One In, which was directed by Thomas Alfredson and scripted, based on his own 2004 novel of that name, by, apologies if I'm getting the pronunciation wrong here, John Avid Lingfist. Although the geographical setting changes from Sweden to New Mexico, the story in both films takes place in the early 1980s and concerns the friendship which develops between a solitary 11-year-old boy and a mysterious girl of apparently the same age, living on the same estate, who turns out to be a vampire. 
These characters are played by Kara Hedebrandt and Lena Leanderson in the Swedish film, and by Cody Smith McPhee and our old friend Chloe Grace Moretz in the American one. The remake is currently available to view on My5 in the UK, and was actually co-produced by some of our other old friends, Hammer, making their first vampire film since 1974's The Legend of the Seven Golden Vampires. It was Matt Reeves, wasn't it? Cloverfield, who wrote yes. and directed the re- the remake, you know, relocation to America. Um, and initially, I think what was interesting is that he was quite reluctant to kind of do that. But again, that was based on a novel, wasn't it? So it didn't come directly. It wasn't just a film adaptation. Um, yeah, that's true. He was quite reluctant yeah. to, 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 to adapt. Um, and I think for, for watching that film as a spectator who I have a very fond, you know, kind of regard for the, the it's Swedish, isn't it? Swedish, yeah. yeah. The, the yeah. Swedish um, film in that it's a really atypical kind of vampire film yeah. that is kind of beautiful and kind of stark and touching in places uh, as well as being very bleak. Um, mm-hmm. I think the thing that I enjoyed most about it, about the the, the um uh, the American version was the point at which it kind of it did the same things <laughs> from the, yeah you know so the kind of just the anticipation for the you know kind of the um, the swimming pool sequence at the end yeah. and yes. the you know the it's kind great. of the, yeah the and even at the beginning the kind of you know uh, hanging man um, in the snow mm. um, and you know those bit, bits the points at which the film kind of referred back to its you know its um, the, the original version, I thought, were lovely, but I'm not sure it necessarily gave me anything new, I have to say. No, that's exactly pretty much what I've got written down here on my notes is this is basically identical. Yeah. The yeah. only thing that stood out as different, and it wasn't even different, you know when, um, so in the remake, he's called Owen. Yeah. Um, He asks her to go steady, and she says she's not a girl. Yeah. Mm. In the Swedish, in the original version... That it's just left yeah. at that, and it's mm. kind of like, well, did he just not hear her, or is he choosing to just not hear her? But in the the American remake, they have a little conversation about it, so there's no ambiguity yeah. there. Yeah. Mm. And I thought, and I did, I just wondered why did they not just leave that ambiguous like they did in the Swedish Swedish version? Um, but apart from that, I couldn't really see anything else that was that was different. So all that we've talked about for the last hour, you know, of remakes giving you something new and adding things yeah. in or a different ending and some extra backstory with with let me in i was a bit i felt they didn't really do much yeah with it yeah i think the rules are slightly different when it comes to um a non-english language film being remade in hollywood right. i think um i don't mean to say that kind of loftily i just think the the tendency is for the hollywood production to kind of look at the film and go that was pretty good let's do that but in english <laughs> yeah um, subtitles but, but, and maybe explain some bits of a little bit more you know as in make things a bit more obvious probably also make a couple of bits slightly less disturbing because we want to aim at a, a wide audience um <laughs> and uh, i mean and i know that there are lots of examples of supposedly terrible uh remakes like the vanishing where they changed the ending and things i haven't seen that yeah but with let me in it reminded me of um the american and norwegian versions of insomnia which are in quite close i think but it was just like very noticeable that they'd softened things um and made certain things more obvious and yeah. and i still thought that the remake was good in both cases and I enjoyed, in both cases, seeing the story again. But, yeah, I didn't get a huge amount more out of it. Except that, oh, isn't it nice that that character is speaking English now? <laughs> and isn't that nice that he's now played by Robin Williams stroke Richard Jenkins? Yeah. Um, you, you know, the, just that kind of additional layer of recognition, I guess. Mm-hmm. Which I think is what they're aiming for. Yeah, it's, they're aiming for accessibility, isn't it? But I think that, yeah. you know that in order for the, those kind of texts to, you know, kind of, I don't know, have the value that they really ought to have, the, the, you know, the, the the point of spending the money is mm. shouldn't just be a, oh, yeah, we're going to make this into, you know, we're just going to put it in English and explain a little bit more. And, you know, the, 
I'd want a little bit more kind of creativity yeah. and artistic kind of development, making it slight, you know, so it offers something new, something different. Mm-hmm. And this one, I didn't feel like it did, you know. Yeah, mm. I agree. I think that's fair enough. Um, also, by the way, that ticks off our hat trick of Chloe Grace Moretz horror remakes. <laughs> 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 um, I think now is probably a good time to just chime in with my instinctive feelings on on, on remakes in general, um, because I, I find myself um, kind of uh, sort of agreeing with you to a certain extent, Kirsty. Uh, I know that there's. Um, an illogic to this, but I think the way that I feel about remakes is that, in theory, I'm fine with them. Um, I, I I'd like them to have different titles because I I think that I do have a, an artistic kind of um, attachment to the idea of here's a unique work of art, and um, it's only becoming less unique, tarnishes it in some way. But I would be fine if the new version, even if it was very similar in in loads of other ways, just had a different name. So I wouldn't have to go (laughs) Robocop 1987 and Robocop 2014. Um, And and sometimes I think that the the actual remake um, would be better if it had a different name because I feel like you've not really earned the name like the original (laughs) film did. The original film was called that for a reason, but you're just yeah. called that because the original film was called yeah. that. Yeah. Um, having said that, I'm also aware that, you know, I do love the remake of The Fly and the remake of Invasion of the Body Snatchers from 1978 mm-hmm. and the, the Thing from 1981, and they all didn't change their names. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I know that I'm not I'm not consistent like that. Um but I do I, something else I want to say as well is that I I think it can be helpful, uh, you know, the tradition of remaking. Sometimes if I think it comes up frequently in horror that there's the the trope that this happens again and again or this has happened before, mm-hmm. and therefore you have a remake and sometimes that kind of strengthens it. The idea that you're seeing something and you kind of remember already seeing it but here you're seeing it again. And sometimes that's like explicitly part of the narrative. So um, like in The Thing, in John Carpenter's The Thing, um, Kirsty, you were talking about the idea of the film, the remake or the new franchise entry kind of showing some awareness of where it relates to its original and how it fits in. And that movie isn't a sequel and as a remake, it's very different from its original. But they do find a way in the narrative of kind of making you remember the original because they set up the idea that what's happening in, in our story has happened previously and they show footage of the previous event which isn't footage from the original film but it kind of reminds you of it yeah right. so there's a sense of memory there um, and I think that's that's one technique which a filmmaker can use on the other hand you know David Cronenberg's The Fly has nothing from 1958 the fly at all um and 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 you could interpret that as being quite disrespectful but again that's an adaptation from a literary source and you can Mm. always or the filmmaker can always justify leapfrogging a previous version and just say oh no i'm going back to the original source yeah there's i mean is this a good point to sort of bring in you know if we're talking about kind of modes of remakes and the way in which those are located um it might be quite a good point to talk about the kind of going back to that idea of um you know kind of remaking for an english audience uh an english speaking audience rather um that the you know kind of in the 2000s there was that you know kind of trend for um american filmmakers to remake the kind of um the big hits of j-horror in the Mm. late 90s so you know like the ring for example yeah yeah dark water yeah and dark water and the grudge obviously kind of make most notably editorial down interrupting again to fill in the background to 2003's the grudge directed by takashi shimizu this American production from Sam Raimi's Ghost House Pictures, starring Sarah Michelle Gellar, is a semi-remake of Shimizu's own film, Juon, a Japanese film released the year before and starring Megumi Okina. 
These films centre on a cursed house in Tokyo which harbours malevolent spirits created by the history of unhappy deaths in the house and which passes on its curse to anyone who enters the house. There have been several sequels to both films and the latest American entry, also entitled Just the Grudge, released earlier this year and directed by Nicholas Pesci, looks like another remake but apparently is also a sequel. At least that's what it says on Wikipedia. I have to say I've avoided it. I always found kind of interesting about those is the way in which kind of for me anyway that the kind of relocation to an American context meant that those you know texts were being reinterpreted within you know the kind of American genre mode, um, mm. and so therefore for me they became less scary because yeah. they became more predictable. Whereas there's something as a you know watching horror, particularly when you're watching um, a horror film that comes from a context which is you're, you're alienated from, you don't understand, um, you know, the kind of cultural norms, I suppose, or the way in which, yeah. um, you know, the kind of sim- symbology or whatever from that particular culture, that the, you know, J-horror for me always felt more scary and more strange because, yeah. of, um, because of that cultural dislocation. Um, so on the whole i didn't felt that worked for me but the interesting exception i'm not sure it was particularly scary but um with um the grudge so the original grudge due on 2002 um was then remake was it remake um with the original director um yeah yes starring sarah yeah. michelle geller in an Eng- kind of largely English speaking film, but as her as an American character in Tokyo, which is where the original film is set. Yeah. Um, and I thought that was a really, you know, kind of interesting, you know, kind of approach to take in, you know, kind of honoring in many ways the kind of cultural, um, uh, you know, kind mm. of context of the original and the original creator because um, uh, Takashi uh, Shimizu um, not only directed but also wrote the the screenplay for the original as well. So to have him involved in the kind of authorship of the remake, I thought was mm. was uh, you know kind of interesting. Yes. Yeah. yeah. More of an amalgamation of, of the two rather yeah. than yeah, right, yeah. We're starting again sort yeah. of situation. Yeah. But they, they came. They got in trouble, not in trouble, but they came under quite a bit of flack, though, didn't they, by casting Sarah Michelle Gellar as, uh, what's she called, Karen Davis is the character. Um, but, yeah, she portrayal was met how, with how uh, so? some Do criticism. It's interesting, because that wasn't a pre-existing character. No. Mm. Um. But, she, yeah, I think she's, it was just, you know, why... <laughs> why do we have to have Sarah Michelle Gellar in it? Um, okay. I think it was kind of the fact that, like, you know, if remaking it, and it's Bill Pullman's in it as well, isn't he? Yes. In in The Grudge. But yeah, I think there was just a bit of, well, why? A lot of, yeah, why? It, it, similar to um, when, what's she called? Oh, Scarlett wow. Johansson? Scarlett Johansson, yeah, in um, yeah. Ghost in the Machine. Yeah, Ghost in the Shell. Similar, but Ghost yeah, but, the she, shell. but she was playing a pre existing was, yeah. character, yeah. though. Who, who was, you know, known to be um, Japanese, I think. So there was a, there was a kind of ethnicity whitewashing Ethnic- con- controversy around that. Yeah. Whereas maybe it was more the fact that they just chosen to, even though they kept the movie set in Japan in, in the remake of The Grudge, they chose to make the lead yeah. character a white person. Yeah. Yes, I think uh, I think maybe felt that she was a bit. A bit shoehorned in, perhaps, so that it didn't necessarily need to have to be a, an American yeah. white actress. Mm. You know, the film still capable of following the film if the character of all the actors aren't. Okay, white but then are, it, it, you know, it's the same criticism. <laughs> yeah. Well, so I suppose it is, but, but uh, kind of leveled at those kind of wholesale relocations and recasting of you know, so to mm. completely erase the original kind of cultural context to make it you know. And um, it's probably not any better. <laughs> I'd like to say two things about The Grudge 2003, though. Firstly, um, I, I believe the director views all of the Grudge films as being part of the right. same universe. Right. Um, and it, and it, it kind of keys into that um, element that I l- alluded to about the repetition of things happening again and again. Because it, I, I haven't seen all the Grudge films, but it's basically a cursed house, isn't it? There's 
text at the start of the remake of The Grudge kind of says, anyone who goes into this house will yeah. be cursed. So basically you've got an infinite engine of stories that are mainly <laughs> the same, in which different people yeah. just move in, and then horrible yeah. stuff happens to them. Um, <laughs> and that, and But the director, I think, he'd stated that they're all in the same universe. He doesn't regard any of them as remakes of the other, because, yeah, a lot of them are very similar, but that's the point. Mm. Um, the other thing I, I would say is that that movie really worked for me. You might not have found it too frightening, Kirsty. I think it's one of the most frightening films I've ever wow. seen. I very nearly put it in my the, list. The, the Sarah Michelle Gellar one. Oh, right. um, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I, I'd not seen the original okay. when I saw yes. that. Um, and and I, I went back, after I watched it, I did go and watch half of the original <laughs> film. Uh-huh. And... Uh, it was great. I just thought. Okay, I was going to say, is it only half because you buckled it halfway through? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Turn all the lights on. Not doing this. Because <laughs> I, I did think that they were very similar, and in a way, mm-hmm. even the the American version, it doesn't have um, like a traditional narrative. It seems to be just a series yeah. of events where people are ambushed by this horrifying <laughs> ghost. Um, one person, it appears under her bed sheets. And I think I watched the film in bed. <laughs> <It was> like, <laughs> um, so, yeah, it, it, it really yeah. messed with me. And um, I, I, it's not a movie that I particularly want to go back to, I think, because it felt like it didn't really have a story. But I just found it so relentlessly uh, yeah. chilling. And, the, mm-hmm. and all the movies up until the, the most recent one, I think, have in common that horrifying noise which the ghost <laughs> makes yeah. which I believe is actually the director <laughs> himself, yeah. he makes that noise yeah um, and yeah, oh gee so. I don't know if I've mentioned before maybe to you guys, maybe not on here but my husband yeah. Yeah. doesn't like horror at all right. and um, he did watch the 2003 Grudge with Sarah Michelle Geller with me um, I think just as an experiment, see if maybe Japanese horror was the way for him to go, that we could enjoy some films together. Not and it turns right. out absolutely not. <laughs> it's to do with that. So I think I did get a good few months of being able to just go uh, yeah. near him and he'd go, stop that. Oh, dear, <laughs> Don't want to hear that noise. <laughs> so yeah, ab- absolutely not was his uh, response. <laughs> I, don't know if I think you should keep us up to date with um, with his responses to, to all of these. <laughs> this should be a regular feature. Well, for, for this podcast, he did watch the crazies yeah. with me all right L- the weekend not saturday just gone the one before so we watched the remake of the crazies and that was fine that's okay. that passed oh, okay that was, okay that's, that's allowed in yeah well uh, shall we talk <laughs> about that then for a moment yeah. editorial done again with the final interruption and some background to the crazies this american film released in 2010 and directed by breck eisner is a direct remake of a 1973 film written and directed by George A. Romero. Both films have the same title, and essentially the same plot. A viral outbreak in small town USA turns ordinary people into violent psychopaths, and a small number of uninfected individuals must try to get to safety while the military establishment struggles to contain the situation. The remake is currently available to view on Amazon Prime in the UK. I found it not too frightening, but I think the reason is because of the the current yeah. pandemic situation in the world. It's <laughs> not that, that there's a kind of dual thing which it does to a lot of apocalypse stories. As horror fans, on the one hand, we're looking around at the world and going, it's not so bad, there are no <laughs> zombies. It could be worse. <laughs> but on the other hand, when you see a, a, a movie or a new movie that uses those tropes, it just kind of feels a bit cheap now. It's like, yeah, mm-hmm. we know this stuff yeah. is scary. Yeah. What else you got? Context um, is everything. I mean, I I enjoyed it, but I really enjoyed it. I thought mm. I thought it was um, maybe more in the first half than the second half. But I thought it yeah. was really funny. <laughs> like, there was some okay. quite good gags. Uh, so you know the bit in in the morgue with the bone saw oh, yeah. running along oh, the yeah. floor <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. at him. That was hilarious. So I I, I wasn't expecting it to be um, am, amusing. I guess I thought it'd be. I don't, I don't, I don't know what it was going to be, just watching a new film. Um, but yeah, I thought lots of it was really funny. And it I did thought, have a sardonic edge to it, didn't it? And, yeah. and the fact that it starts with the Johnny Cash cover of We'll Meet Again playing and yeah. ends with a cover version of Bring yeah. Me Sunshine. Mm-hmm. 
This is a classic well. way for any horror, really horror film to end, isn't it? Bring me sunshine, I think. Yes. <laughs> well, by invo- certainly <laughs> for British audiences, your... invoking yeah. thoughts of Morgan and yeah. Weiss. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's not what I expected. No, it's, I think with the crazies, I'd not, I've like... not seen the original, but I have seen the, the newer version. And again, it, it, it mm. seems... I mean, I'm a big Timothy Oliphant fan, so that was probably the draw for that particular mm-hmm. he's, he, yeah. he's great um he's and good, yeah. and i it, part of it makes me wish that he just his career had taken him slightly more into kind of leading man territory um uh mm. but uh, the, like the car wash sequence yeah. i remember being kind of particularly affecting i think yeah that yeah. yeah yeah that yeah. was possibly the best um, and it has no spoilers mm-hmm. um it has you know so this is a, a kind of intertextual reference to other episodes it has exactly the kind of ending that i like of horror and that's all i'm going to say yes Right, yeah. okay. I agree, hundred percent. No, yeah. I like that too. Actually, you're in the credits roll, and you go, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I felt it was it was a, it was a zombie film, but it was also a slasher film. I felt because yes. they have, um, well, they can think sort of, or they could use weapons and you know make choices. The the infected, so it felt very slashery yeah. at yeah. points as well. And it was like I love a zombie film and I love a slasher film, so excellent i'm all i'm all up for this but yeah really enjoyed it uh i felt the small town america aspects felt a bit yeah a bit walking dead e at times yeah. and this this was 2010 so it was when walking dead launched on television um, and that sort of post 28 days later kind of zombie full collapse situation yeah which i mentioned last week that i'm always highly uncomfortable with but this film sort of offset it for me because it it was funny there's you know there's no laughs in 28 days later is there but there's there's plenty of laughs mm-hmm. in the crazies which is good mm. um did i write anything else no i don't think so yeah just that i was laughing <laughs> uh, uh, have either of you well Kirsty, you said you haven't seen the original have you seen the original stella i have but a long time ago uh, i saw it a couple of years ago and i thought that the main point of comparison and that, which i thought was a reasonable route for the remake to take was that um, if you don't know the original The Crazies, but you know Night of the Living Dead and you know they're Mm -hmm. both by George A. Romero, Mm -hmm. you might read the plot of The Crazies and go, oh, it's another kind of zombie movie or apocalypse Mm -hmm. movie from George A. Romero. I'll watch that. But then when you watch the movie, it is kind of quite different. Um, You know, Night of the Living Dead focuses on the people being besieged and The Crazies... The original is more about the ineptness of the authorities' response, yeah, and 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 has also has a layer of comedy to it, but different to the remake has. Um, whereas, so what the remake does is basically go, let's take that same idea but do it as if George A. Romero was making Night of the Living Dead and keep it focused on those few characters, um, and therefore kind of streamline the narrative. I mean, there were still points in it about the authorities and and mm-hmm. and and inefficiency of of them trying to deal with the situation but those were kind of kept to the sidelines we we saw them through the eyes of the main characters um and how they were being affected by those things mostly whereas you you actually had kind of viewpoint characters in the original who were you know scientists working with the government trying to contain the virus and things like mm-hmm. that um i would just say that i, I found that it was I enjoyed it but I found that it was slightly muddy in in the way that it mixed the slasher and the zombie trope because mm-hmm. I felt like I needed to be given a little more specificity about to what extent are the people infected just crazy and violent and to what extent can they still choose and plan because some of them are quite organized you know working in groups <laughs> yeah. um yeah. and I think there was probably an, a level of implication there that uh, lots of small town American people are already pretty crazy, and all they want to really do is shoot stuff and um, <laughs> uh, and mess things up, and therefore this just brings out their their natural urges. But I, I don't think there, there was quite enough in the script to really bring that into focus. I did think it yeah. was part of it. Because the the opening scene is like an infected person wanders into a a softball game, I think. Yeah. And the and he has a gun in his hand, 
and the, the police's immediate response is, he's been drinking. <laughs> he's like, been drinking. We, so, we could talk about this. <laughs> so, you know, not so sure like, that you can. <laughs> it's just normal. You know, they'll have a drink and then they'll pick up a 12 ball. That's what they do. This is a lot about America, doesn't um, it? Yeah. It um, which, you know, I think saying that making those kind of observations about American life is part of the engine that drives yes. the zombie yeah, genre. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um, so... That's fair enough. Can I yeah. just? Uh, uh, this, anybody, I'm just obviously trying to shoehorn this in because this has clearly become a thing that I do. So, um, crazies. Mm-hmm. Also, can I shout out to uh, Joe Anderson, who's in the crazies, um, who plays the um, who plays Russell, who's the kind of deputy. He's great. He is great, yeah. isn't he? Um, he's also in Hannibal. Um, so I just thought I'd put that okay. up there. Um, so he plays <laughs> um, Mason Verger in uh, series three. Um, oh, so he's the recast. Yeah, he's mate, the recast uh, after they right. got rid of Michael Pitt. Um, yeah, so he's mm. he's uh, he's our Hannibal link for this week. So I will endeavour to do that in every every episode. There right, we go. Okay. Good. Well, done. Keep the just <laughs> let's just keep teasing the audience yeah. and keep saying, "Don't worry, we're going to do a whole Hannibal episode at one point." But for it's moment, more just to remind you, Dan, that you need to watch it. So yes, um, and I, specifically, I need to watch series three, don't I? So that will be another reason. And to me watch as well. That. I've not seen all of it, yeah. so. But, you know, I I like it when, um, you know, you need to replace an actor and luckily that character is under prosthetics anyway, so yes. you can functionally replace them and the audience yeah. will never even notice. Well, yeah, we did um, we did notice, but... Yeah. <laughs> right, OK. But it, it was, it was, it was a, yeah, an admirable <laughs> substitution. So. Ah, you fanables. <laughs> OK. Oh, nice one. So, yeah, I thought he was really engaging in the crazies, so... Um, I'm happy to see whatever else he's in. That's great. Stella, so um, have we covered everything you'd like to say about remakes? Are, are there any other particular texts or movies that you'd like to go into detail before we finish? Um, I think we've pretty much covered everything. I mean, yeah, I'm still going to always champion and cheer for remakes, I think, on the, on the sidelines. Um, yeah. Have any of you, have you two changed your mind at all? I think, yeah, I think, I think for me, it's, you know, I, I, what's been useful about this discussion and, and indeed kind of the, the run up to the discussion is just really reflecting on that, that my response is too certain, not all remake makes carry in particular is, you know, um, mm. is a very emotional one. And it's, it's very much connected to my emotional investment in the, you know, the kind of the original version. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that I'm okay with, faithful adaptations that uh, that do something you know kind of new and different and exciting with it um i'm less yeah. okay with uh, you know the this is not a horror example but for example um one of my very favorite films is um vin vendor's Wing, wings of desire which was remade mm-hmm. in the late 1990s i think in an american context uh, into a film called city of angels uh with, with nick cage. with nick cage oh. and meg ryan mm. I, I, I just uh, yeah. yeah oh it pa- <laughs> like it pains me that that even happened i have to say um yeah yes at least they changed the title though kirsty so therefore i'm fine they, they with did it. they did yeah so uh, uh, uh. yes yeah, so, so if you know you know and it's yeah so, yeah so no i think it's that sense of that kind of the um, you know emotional connection to yeah. films and it's it's difficult to um well to I sometimes divorce that from the kind of more rational kind mm-hmm. of academic thinking about them so <laughs> Yeah, Yeah, uh, I think I'd agree with that on the whole. Um, I think your argument um, and your perspective is really good, Stella. I don't think it really changes my position, but I don't think I was really in opposition to it. I think it does come down to very personal connections that we have to films, and we don't... It does. You know, we don't like the idea of them walking over um, something that's really personal to us, um, Mm -hmm. and it does feel almost as if... Our, a part of our own past is being erased or something or, or tarnished, which is irrational, but it's that's a personal thing. Um, yeah. In in general theory, I, I'm okay with the idea of remakes as something which kind of expands the, the narrative of a previous movie or just gives a different perspective mm. on it. I mean, so my um, feeling about remakes that was at the worst point was in the early 2000s when the spate of horror remakes started, which I think was with the Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2003, yeah. which um, I yeah. think if I'm... I, I could be wrong because I haven't seen it, but I, 
you said it was sort of a reboot, but it's isn't it also kind of a sequel? Because doesn't it, or a prequel or something? It ends with the same character, Sally, um, escaping, or, or or starts with it, or so, there's something that narratively connects it to the original film. Yeah, it's. I've got it listed as remake slash reboot. Right. So it's it's trying to send it off in a slightly different direction at mm. the end. Um, but, I mean, it's really not that different. I think the right. the teenagers, if anything, are more annoying than <laughs> right. they were in, the, in the 1974 version. Um, th- although everyone is wearing a bra. Well, that, that's good. It's, good. <laughs> so there, so it's good to well, know. Rough. <laughs> So there, there has been some progress, but yeah, it's it is what it is. I think mm. it's all right. I don't think Leatherface is as um, interesting a monster, to be fair. Okay. But you know, it's the the audio is better on it because I think we mentioned was it last week or the week before we mentioned that all, all the screaming oh. in the nineteen seventy four Texas Chainsaw does get a bit yeah. on top after a while. So the, there's less of that in the in the remake slash reboot, but. You know, if if you're happy with the original, be happy with the original. Well, um, I would expect the audio to be slicker in the more modern production. Yeah. But I'm interested to see it visually, bizarrely, because it's shot by the same DP as the original. Mm. And it's that interesting question of, oh, you're doing it again. Are you going to do it differently or the same? Mm. And I just, yeah. the, the, the two versions of Red Dragon also have the same DP. Mm-hmm. And and uh, I just think that's an interesting kind of creative comparison. Mm. Um, in those two movies, there are certain scenes which almost look the same, yeah, uh, because of the way they're shot and lit. Um, going back to the time when those remakes started happening, I suppose m- most of my personal stake in remakes was kind of burnt out because I remember thinking, "Oh, they're clearly just going to remake all the old horror movies." Well, I'm mm-hmm. fine with it as long as they don't remake The Wicker Man and Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> and then what happened, Dan? And within three Nicolas years, Nicolas Cage. <laughs> yeah. So, and then I went, "Yeah, fine, bye." Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, well, no, I, I was like, "Fine, you can't hurt me anymore. It's fine." <laughs> um, and if, uh, and and maybe if we talk about Midsummer at some point, yeah, which, um, we were. Yeah. which yeah. I kind of view as. Uh, it, to a certain extent, it's it's. Re- I don't mind the idea of of remaking the Wicker Man actually, or or anything, but call it something else and do something else with it. And I think that um, the the things in Midsummer um, that are like the Wicker Man are really effectively joined to things that are nothing like the Wicker Man. So I think that's fine. Um, Get Out is another movie which I I class as sort of taking a structure from the Wicker Man, but doing something very different with mm. it. And and I really like that too. So, um, mm. so yeah, uh, I, I think good remakes are a good thing. Um, yeah, more good remakes, please. Is, is <laughs> we've learned, just we've not, learned that we need more good remakes, you know, and they were all entirely emotionally irrational. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, um, again, another excellent group therapy session. Yes. On, uh, <laughs> Thank you. And now the podcast starts. <laughs> Thank you very much, Stel. That's been fascinating. Um, Okay, so great. Well, um, we've we've come up to our time pretty much once again. Um, just before we go, shall we do our usual round of recommendations? Yeah. Yeah. Um, for the next week. Um, shall we start with you, Kirsty? Okay, so I've got another um, uh, podcast rec for this week, um, which is I just started listening to um, off the back of our discussion a little bit last week. Um, started listening to a podcast called The Left Right Game. All right which is uh, starring Tessa Thompson. Okay. Um, I think she also, also produces it. It's only 10 episodes um, at the moment. Um, and just to kind of set it up a little bit, it is, again, very much in that kind of in mode of investigative journalism, um, kind of storytelling, um, in a way that kind of references, you know, serial 
uh, quite heavily to begin with. Um, and it's about a, a a reporter who, at the beginning of the story, we know she has disappeared. Um, and uh, she's disappeared as part of an investigation into an urban legend, which involves mm. um, essentially kind of going out in your car and just taking the first left turn and then the first right turn and the first left turn and the, or the next right turn, etc., etc., etc. Um, and then eventually weird things start happening. Um, there is uh, in uh, kind of, I think, episode three, there's a very, very gruesome um, moment which is expertly kind of executed in terms of sound design that, to the point where I actually felt a bit sick. Right. Oh, wow. So, um, yes, yeah, so that's my recommendation for this week. Okay, I'm going to check that's that one great. out. Yeah, nice. me too. Thanks, Kirsty. What about you, Stella? Uh, well, I'm going to suggest... Um, it is horror-ish, but I guess you could argue it's not at all. It's a bit uh, true crime. Um, on Channel 4, the last part is on tonight. It's called Murder in the Outback, and it's a look at the Peter Falconio, Joanne Lee's case. Uh, oh, right. He went missing hmm. in the Northern Territory in Australia. Um, so it does have some sort of gruesome crime scene stuff going on, but it's also... it. It, what I like about true crime is that the amount of detail that people can get into, and you know, all the all the backstabbing and you're lying and he's lying and they're lying, and it's it's a really really well done um, true crime documentary without being too salacious, um, but also it's an excellent mystery. So the last part is on tonight as we're filming this on the Wednesday, but it is all available on Channel 4's um, catch up service, all four. Um, yeah, Murder in the Outback, and it's got some fabulous Australian accents in it. <laughs> <laughs> all right nice one but yeah if you like if you like a bit of murder that's a good one for you okay that was really cool all right so my recommendation is gonna complete another hat trick um so it's the um, episode for them today <laughs> well yeah so kirsty you, you your recommendation was a uh i don't want to say mock documentary but you know um yeah well i think the the term that is being used i think is deep fiction Oh, okay. Oh, that's interesting. In a, yeah, it's sort of more in podcast type form, deep right. fiction podcasts. Right. Yeah. And then Stella, y- yours was an actual documentary. Um, mm-hmm. Mine's a sort of doc. Well, mine is also a documentary, but it is about horror movies or the horror genre. And it just occurred to me, and that it was a good one to mention during the course of our discussion. It's um, Mark Germode's Secrets of Cinema. The entire series is on the iPlayer at the moment. BBC ah, iPlayer. Excellent. And oh, the- that's great. The episode about horror is particularly interesting, and I think Mm -hmm. for anyone listening who's a horror fan but has a close friend or or someone they know who's not a horror fan and needs a bit of convincing, Mm -hmm. I think that uh, (laughs) Kurt Mode's episode about horror is a really good one to show them because if anyone's in that preconception that you talked about, Stella, where they feel Mm -hmm. that horror movies are all the same... Yeah. Um... Kermode really nicely delineates different subgenres and different styles, yeah. Um, and kind of opens people's eyes. And I've, you know, shown it to a friend of mine who had that idea about horror, um, and and she kind of did feel that it was uh, kind of illustrated the breadth of the genre and made it seem a bit more mm-hmm. open to her. So I'd really recommend that. That wasn't going to make my original recommendation. My original recommendation to follow up from next week was Tremors 2, which is on <laughs> which is on the Horror Channel um, on Wednesday afternoon. That is the 17th of June. Um, as my recommendation last week was Tremors. And even yeah. though Tremors became a kind of straight-to-video franchise that there are now innumerable movies and they probably aren't very good on the whole... Tremors 2 is a great low-budget sequel. Um, it's got a really inventive script. I remember loving it when it came out in the 90s. Um, and it's worth a catch, I think, especially if you like the original. It does have some relation to it. Fred Ward, who was in the original, uh, comes back, as does Michael Gross. And it's written and directed by the same people. Um, so, uh, yeah, so there you get two recommendations from me this cool. week. Could, so. I, could I just add add one more? Go on. Is that okay? Of course. So, um, and this is just, I didn't, I haven't rewatched it, um, but obviously in kind of preparation for this week, I did notice that um, the original Brian De Palma version of Carrie is um, on Amazon Prime. Oh. As a as a Yay. part of part of their prime, um, and it, it does allow me. I've, I kind of promised myself that I would that I would make reference to this. Um, uh, are you both aware of the the flea bag gag about Carrie? 
Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm not. Can I just not repeat it? All of so, oh, Fleabag, it's amazing. <laughs> so, um, in one episode in series two, Fleabag is asked what her favourite period movie is. Right. She says Carrie. She says Carrie. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, <laughs> that <was> brilliant <laughs> yeah and that should be a recommendation as well watch Absolutely. Fleabag yeah, it's yeah. incredible yeah. yes and also yeah. um, the original stage show version of Fleabag is also yeah. on Amazon Prime at the moment it um, is, yeah. you, you have to pay to, to see it but all the money goes to um, a series of charities fighting the yeah. pandemic so it's it's really good thing to, to just give money to and that's what I'm going to watch I chose to watch that rather than the series Hence, I've stopped at episode three of the series, I think, um, and I'll get, I'll get round to the uh, the stage show as soon as I can. But it's wonderful stuff. Phoebe Waller Bridge, absolutely amazing. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm I'm not remotely jealous of her talent, youth, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> good fortune, but uh, she's wonderful. Yeah, go with Phoebe. Um, all right, brilliant. Well. Thank you very much, Stella, for that fantastic chat. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and that thank was good. you, Kirsty, for your contributions. And yeah, we've uh, we've kind of explored remakes. And um, oh, here's one question to end on, um, Stella. If you had to recommend one remake as an example of something that's really good, to uh, a person should see if they don't like the idea of remakes in general, is the one you choose. I would choose um, Zack Snyder's uh, remake of Dawn of the Dead. Oh, okay. Which we didn't mention, but I enjoyed that yeah. movie. Mm. And yeah, because, again, I, I, I think that that's one where it takes the idea of the original, but, mm-hmm. but essentially flips the genre. It's much more of an action movie yeah. than, than the original. And also it takes the, the 28 Days Later influence yeah. of, the, of the fast zombies. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's a good one. Mixes that into the story. Yeah, I enjoyed that one. So, um, especially the bit with the chainsaw, which I mentioned ah, yes. last week. Chainsaw so. in the van. Ooh. Yeah, <laughs> I won't say anything else. All right, that's wonderful. Thank you very much, folks. Next week, uh, Kirsty and I are going to be um, uh, having a discussion on an archive recording from a few months ago about female horror auteurs. So, um, I hope that the listeners will look forward to that. And. Um, I'm sure I I look forward to the next time we're all chatting together. All right, folks. You too. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. You have been listening to And Now the Podcast Starts. Produced and released by Ambidextrous Solutions Limited. Presented by Kirsty Warrow, T.D. Velasquez, and Stella Gaynor. Special thanks to Greg Hume for our original theme music, and to Brian Gorman for our original artwork. All dialogue and music clips from films, TV shows, and trailers are used for the purposes of criticism in the spirit of fair dealing as defined in UK law and fair use as defined in US law. No copyright infringement is intended. Please visit our home on the web, www.andnowpodcast.com for more content and contact details. Or visit our Facebook pages at and now Pod or at Lee Cushing Pod. Follow us on Twitter at and now Podcast or at Lee Cushing Podcast. If you'd like to donate to us, please visit patreon.com forward slash and now podcast. And now the podcast stops.